Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Adrian from Columbia University. So this is joint work with my advisor, Sal and Simha. Today, we're really excited to talk to you about how we broke energy management, which is a fundamental component on all the systems we have today. Essentially, this is a new class of attack surface, and we call this class of attack clock screw. Today, as we know it, energy management is indispensable. In fact, none of the systems that we have today can exist without energy management. So this is because, as shown by this chart over here, energy density is getting to a totally ridiculous point. As we try to cram more and more functionality into the chips, we are creating hotspots in there. Well, the battery will drain really quickly, or worse, we may even burn a hole in the chip. So because this is so important, practitioners in the industry and researchers in the academia have gone to great lengths to optimize the way we manage energy consumption. So this is clearly very important. So in summary, we have this mechanism, energy management, that we cannot live without and is found on almost all systems and is extremely complicated to design. This is a, real, is a perfect storm for security. And yet, no studies have ever looked into this. And so in this work, we study the mechanisms and show that these systems can be fragile in terms of security. So our, our attack idea is this. So through software, we manipulate the energy management parameters to stretch the operational limits of the device in a way that would induce fault in security-critical software. So why, why is this cool? Because this allows us to sidestep all the requirements of traditional fault attacks, like needing physical proximity, uh, separate equipment, crocodile clips, and all the messy business. But more importantly, this opens up a very new attack surface on something very pervasive on the system. And it also raises the possibility of doing fault attacks remotely. So in a nutshell, what have we achieved in this work? Number one, we found a new software-based attack vector that exploits a mechanism found on almost all systems. We show that this vector can be used to, br uh, to break the security guarantees of uh, trusted execution environments, which happens to be the building block for many security critical applications like secure boot and digital rights management. We disclose our findings to the, to the vendors uh, whose chips are going into hundreds of millions of devices out there. So when we spoke to them, uh, the, the vendors have accepted our disclosure as a highly critical and a very novel attack. And they are currently working towards mitigations and fixes. And finally, with this work, we hope that security can be duly considered uh, during the future designs of the systems. So for the rest of the talk, this is what we're going to do. We will first do a deep dive into a very widely used energy management technique. We will describe its hardware and software support and how it provides the building blocks for the attack. Next, we would outline the challenges that we face and how we address them. Then we describe one of the attacks that we have in the paper. And finally, conclude with some thoughts and key takeaways. So recall we want to stretch the uh, energy management parameters beyond the operational limits. To do that, we exploit existing software support for a technique called DVFS. It stands for Dynamic Voltage and Frequency Scaling. First, let's investigate the underlying hardware regulators that support DVFS. There are two main factors that affect energy consumption, the operating frequency and the voltage. We can think of frequency as how fast a system can process the data. The higher the frequency, the more energy is being consumed. We can think of uh, voltage as how much power to actually supply to the actual system. And the more voltage you have, the more energy consumed. So DVFS saves energy by turning these two knobs based on runtime computing demands. Uh, and more importantly, it's more like uh, putting like a rubber band over these two knobs and carefully adjusting both at the same time. So it just catches DVFS at a very high level. But how does it actually work? Like, uh, how, how do you actually change the frequency and voltage uh, at runtime uh, while you're using a phone? So this is uh, possible due to a combination of uh, hardware and software support for DVFS. So at the hardware level, uh, we, have the, uh, we have the circuit level hardware regulators that control the frequency and the voltage. At the software level, we have the power governors uh, that monitor the runtime usage and initiate frequency and voltage changes using the device drivers. 
By starting the source code of the device drivers, uh, we know that software can control the hardware regulators via memory map registers. Now, this is really interesting because now we know software can affect some physical aspects of your underlying hardware, your frequency and your voltage. So we focus our study on the regulators and their interfaces. For illustration here, uh, we show the schematics of the frequency and voltage regulators we reverse engineer from the Nexus 6 device. The important point to note here on the schematics is that these regulators are configurable from software through the memory map registers. We offer more details on this uh, in our paper for your reference. Now that we know that software can control the frequency and voltage, a fair question to ask would be whether any limits are actually imposed on configuring these regulators. So what we have over here is a Nexus 6 device uh, advertised to run at 2.7 gigahertz. We measure the vendor recommended frequency and voltage at runtime. So on the graph, the frequency is the y-axis, uh, the voltage is the x-axis. So after the measurement, we observe several discrete uh, frequency and voltage operating points. And true enough, like what the vendor has uh, promised, uh, if you look at the top rightmost point, the highest frequency of 2.7 gigahertz is exactly as advertised on the website. And now, we use the software interfaces that we described earlier on to control the frequency and the voltage. For every voltage, we will push the frequency upwards until we see some signs of instability. So this ranges from the app crashing, the device rebooting, or the device freezing. And then we measure the frequency and voltage and plot the same points over here on the same uh, figures. So here are the operating points based on our manipulations. As you can see from this graph, two things are actually very apparent here. Number one, there are indeed no limits uh, in the hardware regulators. You can actually push the frequency past the vendor recommended limits. And number two, when we reduce the voltage, this also lowers the minimum frequency we need to get some kind of instability. So besides the Nexus 6, we also found some similar behavior in other devices. This is like two of the charts that we have as well. And now we know that we can change the frequency and voltage without uh, limits. The next thing we want to assess is how dangerous this is on the device that you're using, your phone, your Nexus 6, and all the different kind of phones you have. As we all know, the ARM devices comes with trust zone technology to isolate the trusted execution environments. So can we perhaps affect the frequency and voltage while the trust zone code is running? So this is a simplified view of a, a trust zone enabled uh, ARM core. Trust zone isolates the trusted code on the left uh, from the trusted code on the right. So in our research, we found that the uh, underlying uh, regulators operate across the security boundaries. Both the trust zone code and the normal untrusted code, they share the same frequency and voltage regulators. So when the untrusted code changes the frequency and the voltage, this change actually affects the execution of the trusted code within trust zone. Now we know that we can actually affect the execution of the trust zone code from outside trust zone using the regulators. And since we have explored the energy management mechanisms and their interfaces, we have uncovered several building blocks for our attack. In the next section, we will describe how we piece things together into an interesting attack. Ultimately, we want to ask, can we attack the trust zone code execution from outside trust zone using purely software control uh, regulators? The idea is to push the frequency and voltage past the uh, operational limits of the device to induce some kind of timing fault. Ultimately, this is to break the confidentiality and integrity uh, guarantees of trust zone. Note that we are not looking at availability here because it's, uh, it's really trivial to break it over here. You make it freeze and you make it boot, reboot. Uh, that is an availability attack. Now, before I, I talk about injecting faults using uh, the regulators, I want to give a quick sketch on why faults occur on the system when you increase, uh, say, the frequency past the recommended values. So now, if you look at the, the, the devices that we have today, all the digital circuits are made up of electronic uh, components and we call them flip-flops. Think of uh, flip-flops as uh, elements uh, that store some kind of state, uh, say a bit one or a zero, and each flip-flops has uh, an input and an output. 
uh, in, within the actual device itself, there's actually a lot of uh, flip-flops. So they need a way to coordinate the operations together in syn a synchronized manner. So they need to coordinate this operation using a common clock signal. The, the flip-flop can only change the state together at each clock pulse. And the data needs to flow from one flip-flop to the other, and usually there's some kind of intermediate path in between. Say you want to transfer a bit one from one end of the flip-flop to the other. Now it takes some time for you to propagate the data bit, but more importantly, it needs to do it within the consecutive pulses of the clock signal. So there's actually a hard timing uh, delay, uh, deadline in some sense. And now say we want to transfer the bit zero uh, to the other end. And what happens when we increase the frequency uh, too much? So what this means is that the clock pulses would occur more frequently at any given time. Since the, the, the flip-flops change the states only at the clock pulses. So this means that the data may have less time to propagate through the entire path that you want. And as a result, while the output is supposed to be zero, it remains as the old value one. And at a high level, this manifests uh, itself as a bit flip from zero to one. So for example, in practice, during the memory transfer operation that we try to inject the fault in in our experiments, we see faults uh, like the following. Uh, we might see like a, a corrupted byte of about one or two, and then uh, we might see the old values being propagated to the next uh, byte position. Now that we understand how fault occurs uh, by manipulating frequency, let's talk about some of the challenges that we have to face when we want to conduct this attack. To pull off in inducing a fault in a self-contained device entirely from the software is extremely challenging. So these are some of the challenges we overcome. Uh, we outline these challenges and briefly describe how we address them. So for one, overclocking requires being able to set the frequency uh, way past the uh, suggested values. And we have seen earlier that the hardware regulators have no limits. So in fact, any operating points above the blue slope that you see here uh, is a possible candidate for the attack values. Now, in the, by doing all this in a self-contained environment, uh, both the attack code and the victim code, they have to execute on the same environment. So how do we prevent the attack code from attacking itself or even attacking something that we don't want to target at all? So for this, we exploit the emerging trend that uh, the many, many energy management mechanisms are getting more fine-grained. Many devices, such as the one we attack, have separate frequency regulators for each of the cores. And so, we pin the threat execution of the attack and victim code to separate different cores. So this helps to isolate the effects of the fault injection to only the victim th threat that we want. And the environment that we're attacking is actually on an, is on an actual phone. Uh, so this is a complex OS. To deal with that, we carefully design our attack uh, to disable the interrupts during the window of attack. And coupled with uh, core pinning, this reduces a lot of noise in our attack. And for many attack scenarios, we need precise timing as to when uh, the fault should be injected and for how long. And we also need very fine grain timing resolution. For example, just to give a, give a sense of the, the difficulty, in one of the attack scenarios, uh, we need to inject a fault uh, within a very small window of about 65,000 clock cycle. And we need to do this while the victim threat is running, and the entire victim threat runs approximately about 1.1 billion uh, clock cycle. So this is a scale of uh, difficulty that we're actually looking at. And for timing resolution, we rely on assembly level no-op loops for high precision timing delays. And to guide the timing of our fault delivery, we rely on cache side channel based uh, profiling techniques. With this general attack uh, architecture, we will proceed to attack two security guarantees of the ARM trussel. We explore two attacks uh, in the paper. In the first attack, we break the confidentiality of ARM trust zone by inferring the secret AES key that is being stored in the ARM trust zone. In the second attack, the integrity attack, we show how clock screw can trick trust zone into loading a self-signed app within trust zone. Now, in the interest of the time, we will only describe the first attack. Uh, please refer to the paper for more details on the second attack. The threat model for the first attack, the key inference attack, is this. 
we have an AES uh, decryption app that is running within Trust Zone. Uh, it uses a secret key that cannot be accessed from the non-secure normal world. So this is as a result from uh, the protection from ARM Trust Zone isolation. Now the attacker wants to extract this secret key out from the Trust Zone. And we assume that the attacker outside Trust Zone, they can re repeatedly invoke uh, the decryption uh, app. And then we assume that the attacker has software access to the uh, hardware regulators and thus can inject the clock screw uh, fault into the uh, decryption operation. What we want to do with this attack is to induce the fault while the AES decryption is happening within Trust Zone. Here we show an expected operation where we get the correct uh, plain text from the decryption. We will now invoke the same true decryption operation again, but this time we will induce a timing fault at the de uh, decryption to result in a faulty plain text. So using this pair of correct and faulty plain text, we can apply differential fault analysis in Tunstall work to, uh, to infer the secret key that we want. To induce a timing fault to the uh, decryption execution, uh, these are some of the parameters we use uh, in, in the attacks. Now the hardest part of the attack is actually to figure out how to inject a one byte fault to the seventh AES round during the decryption. So luckily we can profile the execution timing of the trust zone code uh, using hardware cycle counters, uh, even when we are outside trust zone. This allows us to, uh, to, to perform timing profiling of the victim app from outside trust zone. So the first question we want to ask is this, how long does the decryption operation take? Uh, does it vary from run to run? If it changes too much, we're going to have a very rough time uh, injecting the fault to where we want. So here we plot a histogram of the, the execution time of uh, the decryption, and we see that more than 80% of the invocation takes between 800 to 900,000 cycles. So in terms of execution time, there's not much variability for the victim map. Next, on the attacker side of things, recall that we are using a uh, number of no-op loops uh, to, to time the delivery of the fault. So is this an accurate proxy for controlling the timing of our fault injection? So here we plot the number of no-op loops we use, the delay that we use uh, before the fault was actually being injected against the execution uh, duration of the attack threat. So we see a clear predictable linear relation. So this parameter is a good proxy. And our, fault, uh, our differential fault analysis require our fault model to achieve two things. We need to exactly corrupt only one byte in the seventh AES round. Let's evaluate how we can uh, do that. <clears throat> so how likely can we inject a fault in exactly one AES round? Here, we plot a frequency histogram of the number of AES rounds where the fault occurs. We see that more than 60% of the resulting fault are actually precise enough to affect exactly one round. Now, how likely can we corrupt exactly just one byte that we want? Here we plot the frequency histogram of the number of corrupted bytes when one AES round is faulted. We see that out of uh, the above fault that affects one round, more than half are transient enough to corrupt exactly one byte. We end off with a summary of the results for this attack. Uh, it's evident that controlling the no-op loops uh, before the, the fault delivery allow us to precisely time wh which of the targeted AES round that we want. It takes roughly about 20 attempts uh, to induce a one byte uh, fault to the desired AES round. Subsequently, about 12 minutes uh, to conduct the differential fault analysis uh, to get about 3,650 3, key uh, hypothesis, after which we could just brute force it uh, for the correct key. So next, I want to round up the talk with some thoughts uh, on the applicability of this attack to other platforms and our possible defenses and some key th takeaways. So the industry is definitely trending towards uh, finer grain and increasingly heterogeneous uh, designs. So as a result, we're going to see designs which give software more control over the energy management. We probably see this on 64-bit uh, ARM architecture in the newer Intel processes, or even the cloud, uh, cloud computing providers uh, that are increasingly giving VM gas more control over the power management. So thinking about the security ramifications of uh, this design is certainly warranted. So there are possible defenses both on the hardware and software level, but one thing is clear. 
there is no clear defense that can entirely prevent a uh, clock screw style kind of attack. So many of the design decisions that contribute to the possibility of this attack is in fact driven by real practical engineering concerns, like you have to be fast, you've got to be responsive, you have to be cheap. So looking at all this, it seems like a full system response is actually needed for an effective defense for clock screw. And to round up the talk, I'll briefly highlight the key takeaways from, uh, from this work. One, we discovered a new class of uh, attack surface, mainly enabled by the uh, software interfaces of uh, energy management mechanisms. And we show that it can be used to attack trusted execution environments. One thing we want to emphasize here is ultimately it's not a, a hardware or software bug. It, it results from the fundamental design flaw of the energy management uh, mechanisms. And as such, the future energy management designs must uh, take security into consideration, especially in the context of the use of hardware and force uh, isolation. And uh, we would like to do a shout out to like the vendors who have been really responsive, uh, really, really receptive uh, to our disclosure, and we are talking to them to fi try to fix the issue. And uh, with that, I am uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, great and scary work. Um, <laughs> during the, the uh, work on this research, how many phones did you fry? Interestingly, I didn't want to fry any phones. That's why I opted for software only control of the regulators. So it freezes, it took a while for it to reboot itself, but yeah, I didn't fry it anything. It ends up working out. Great, yeah. lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, uh, Hi, Alexia. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Welcome. Um, uh, quick question. How? Um, Maybe a, a related question. Yeah. How specific is the attack to an, uh, an individual device? Right? Did you try? You know, once you have the timing working just right for one device, right. you know, does it work on e even just another instance of the same device model, or do you have to retune it for each individual device? And most likely each individual model, right? Right. So if you recall from the scale of the difficulty for the attack, the timing precision is extremely important. And due to manufacturing variation, you do have to retune uh, the parameters of the attack for specific instances, models of the different devices. So likely if you have one device that uses different microarchitectural uh, units uh, versus another one that uses some other, maybe a different cache or different kind of stuff, you're likely going to have to retune some of the parameters of the but, but if it's if it's the same model and just just two different devices, have you tried that and see if it's if it will just work or if it yes, it, it, it still it still works across like the same. Uh, so if you're looking at Nexus 6, for example, yeah. you want to try on the new Nexus 6 thing. Mm -hmm. We observe the same kind of glitches that happens as well. Okay, with the same timing parameters and everything. Or uh, slightly different. You still have to retune a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you, can you venture a guess? Of like it's like an hour of work to to retune it or. You know, five minutes of work or like uh, three weeks of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have to run like a script and a whole tech. I, I would, it's probably like a, a few days of work, I guess. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Hugo. Hey, uh, Hugo from Arm. Um, yeah. um, I'm going to have to go back and check, but I have a feeling our um, security guidance documents basically recommend uh, or make people aware of this type of attack and recommend various mitigations. Right. Obviously, that information is not getting propagated correctly and whatever, something's gone wrong there, but I presume you're going to do future work looking at this on other types of devices, um, and I'm, I'd be really curious to see if there are any devices that are not susceptible to this and what kind of defenses they're taking. Right. Those are future work. I guess we would yeah. be looking at some other devices, other, other architecture, but the, the key thing is that this, this class of attacks is, is, is more of a... Um, it's, it's more fundamentally a design flaw mm -hmm. rather than an ac architectural flaw. Mm -hmm. So if you look at some other similar uh, architecture with the same kind of design flaw, then likely they're going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So we want to be really, really careful about like looking into all the different kind of stuff and thinking about how we want to try to solve them. And, and some of our reference designs, for example, the control over the DVS, DVFS parameters is yeah. managed by a separate secure processor that's not accessible to a trusted or untrusted software. Right. So if yeah. if the attacker has no access to uh, the the interfaces to uh, the energy management uh, regulators, then there's there's no way this could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that that will be going grain uh, going against the grain of the what we are trying to go go right now for efficient energy management kind of thing. You need to open up the access, but uh, it's a bit I tough. mean, I, I th there are solutions to that. I <laughs> yeah. don't think it's orthogonal actually. But, yeah. There's yeah. no clear answer to this yeah. really. Yeah. That's why we really need to talk. Like and 
likely any kind of solution they're going to have is going to come from every single layer of the yeah. software stack, including hardware too, yeah. Awesome work. Looking forward to continuing the dialogue. Cheers. Thank you. See you later. Uh, hi, I'm Ta Wang from uh, HKUST. Very nice work, very well done. Um, I'd like to ask you about the key derivation attack. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you need to do, you need to corrupt exactly one byte at exactly the right place, mm -hmm. and you showed that there's a pretty good chance you can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, do you know if you manage to do that? And if you don't know, would you manage to get the wrong key uh, mm -hmm. by accident? Right. Mm -hmm. So during the, our experiment, what we did was we actually instrument the, the application uh, uh, just to get a sense of like how, how difficult it is for us to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So basically instrument that to get all the extract out what the expected, uh, all the round intermediate, uh, what the intermediate round output should be. That's how we actually managed to figure out like the, get all the details that we have. Mm -hmm. After that, after removing like the instrumentation and using some of the timing parameters, uh, we realized that actually you could still get it to work uh, pretty reliably. Pretty reliably. Yeah. So if it doesn't work, you just retry. Exactly. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. well, you're not supposed. It's not even supposed to work in a computational, <laughs> <laughs> computationally feasible manner right I see, now. I see. So, but right now we managed to get it working. Right. Thank you. Yep. Um, Martin Artsen, work for right. NCSC NL. Um, right. Can you comment on the level of access required on the operating systems where you tried this? Right. So uh, one of the assumptions for the attacker is that you need access to the, uh, the interfaces to energy management regulators, right? So right now, we are assuming that you, in order to do that, uh, you need a, a kernel privileges in order to gain access to the memory map registers for the, uh, the energy management interfaces. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Any more questions? Well, Adrian, great work. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Let's thank again our speaker.